Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. While we are getting uh, everybody signed in, I'm just going to go over a couple of things. Today, we have Peg with us to discuss fall vegetables. Uh, it's hard to believe we're already to that time of year, but here we are. Um, so just a couple of notes. If you have attended these classes before, welcome back. As always, we are glad to have you here. If you are new, um, this is a little bit different than some of the Zoom meetings some of you may have been on before. We actually can't see you or hear you on this call. So if you have questions, uh, look at your Zoom menu. There's a Q&A box. You can type the questions into that box, and I'll be watching that during the class um, to give those questions to Peg as she has time to start taking some questions. Um, Peg, for those of you who don't know, really, she needs no introduction. She has been with us for many years. She works primarily in the annuals department at our Fair Oaks store. Um, she is an expert on many, many topics, brings a lot of experience, and she actually worked on our gardening advisor television program that we previously had um, that ended a few years ago. I can't remember exactly how many years ago, but um, anyways, welcome, Peg. We're really glad to have you here today, at, as always, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to get started. Thank you, Sally, and welcome to uh, talking a little bit more about fall vegetables and what we need to do to be successful at it because all of these vegetables do even better when you get them planted for fall and going into winter than they do in spring. So I love to have both, which we're gonna talk about as we go along. But you know, COVID, as we all know, has been a terrible thing and it has kept us at home uh, a great deal and often away from even our families. But one thing that it has done has created a lot of interest in gardening. Uh, that could be whether you're gardening to attract pollinators, which is incredibly popular because we realize the need to do that, and also planting vegetables. And uh, it's thrilling that so many small children are being brought in now and they're helping to select these vegetables. They're helping to plant them. And the beauty of it is when they go out and harvest something that they have grown, chances are pretty good that they are going to eat that. Whether they really like vegetables or not, they're going to do it because they grew it. So hopefully there'll be something from today's program that will uh, help you to help a small child learn how to grow some of their own food. Um, and I'm going to share with you basically some of the things that I have done for many, many years. I love to go ahead and get things in the fall, but a lot of people, especially novice, and it's very important for people who are novice, to know how to do things so that they succeed. Because if they don't succeed, particularly if children don't succeed, they're not likely to do it again. And so we, we really want to give them as much information as we possibly can. And too often people don't start their vegetables either by seed or by plants early enough for them to mature. Now, um, so we want to talk about which ones need to be in the ground right away, whether it's through seeds or through transplants. And the beauty of it is many of these, if you start some from seeds right now and you plant some from transplants, then you'll have two distinct harvest times. So it's not a bad idea to do both. Then you'll have a longer harvest season. Um, the first thing that we probably need to talk about is where is the space that you have to, to grow these things? Even in small spaces, even on a deck or a patio where you can garden in containers. And so you can grow a lot of these things regardless of the size of your space. I'm going to show you in this first picture, my own garden, I do not have a lot of sunshine, but I do in certain areas because I have a lot of, of, of oak trees and wooded areas. This is a garden that has been in existence for 
oh, for 60 years, okay? So the soil in this garden is excellent and we will talk about soil too also today. There is a tremendous mix of things in this garden. And also in this garden are a few fig trees and some blueberry bushes and on the corner, a couple of espalier apples. And so it truly is integrated. So there, there's the fruit and then there's the perennials, the things that uh, are pollinators that bring those pollinators here to the garden to assist with that and, and to help them with their livelihood also. And so I have interspersed uh, the vegetables within this garden. There are now tomatoes and squash, and beets and cucumbers, numerous things growing. But I do have space to start a few things early from seed and then later from transplants. But integrating uh, within your existing garden is a good idea. This one is enclosed with um, a deer fencing, a heavy deer fencing, because I do have deer and, and I want to keep them away from this. If, if you can't do that and you do have deer, you cannot spray them with Vibex, which is what I use a natural material. Uh, is what I use on other things outside this fence to keep them from eating because uh, if the deer don't want to eat it, neither will you, okay? So we can't use Bobex. Uh, a lot of times if you've got a border near your house, you can use a little short uh, fence and put uh, some of the deer netting on that. There are things that you can do to keep the deer from harvesting your vegetables before you do. Okay, so an integrated garden. <laughs> and then the next one is going to show you uh, what I did in the spring in containers. This is broccoli. I got this in quite early as a transplant. And it was in a large pot. All of the things that I have in containers are in large containers. So there were three plants in this container and I harvested those nice big heads and then the side shoots came out and I was able to harvest again. So I was very pleased. Now, broccoli takes a little time to mature. So if you're going to do it by seed, you need to do it within the next few days. And I enjoy doing that either in the soil or in containers. You can also start because we have a wonderful, wonderful supply of these uh, transplants. And you can also do those. You can do more transplants in two or three weeks. Thereby, you'll get a continuous harvest from these things. Now, there is something that I want to say about all these brassicas, which is the cauliflower, the cabbage, uh, the collards, that type of thing. You will, because it's warm, now you need to start now, but you do have to face the fact that it's warm weather and you still are going to get the cabbage fly dropping their caterpillars on these plants. And you don't want that because they're going to eat them. It's not going to be very pleasant to have those little tiny caterpillars intermingled in the heads of your broccoli. And you can't, uh, I don't like to spray with anything that isn't organic. And that particular thing is BT. This is all organic and it only affects caterpillars. And you're only spraying those brassicas, that cabbage and kale, you're only spraying those things and you want to spray before they get established, okay? And you may have to spray at least twice, maybe three times, but you only spray those. So you will not be killing caterpillars that are desirable, okay? It's BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Alrighty, there is another one that the guys like to recommend downstairs. And it's also organic, 
but it kills a few more things than just that cabbage fly. And you do want to be careful how you use this because you, again, want to use it only on those brassicas. Now you can indeed use it. It says for spider mites, strips, leaf miners. If you've got a plant that has a problem with that, you might use it on that specific plant, but I, I don't ever recommend spraying indiscriminately with, with any chemical in, within the garden because I'm very conscious of that balance of nature and, and would like hope that you will do right. So anytime that you do use a chemical, please use it judiciously. Okay, can you repeat the name of the second, the product that you just showed? It's Spinosad. This one is, is called Captain Jack's, but there it's Babonide, but there is another one on the market down there too, but it's Spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, Spinosad. And the other one is BT. People will know what you're talking about if you say BT. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. But you will have to use that until it gets cold. Once it gets cold, then you're not gonna have those little caterpillars anymore. But it's not very pleasant to go out and harvest your head of broccoli and it's full of little caterpillars. Not good, okay? Now, there's another one that I want to really seriously get into the ground right away. And, and I'll talk to you. There we go. This is the peas, the little snap peas, the ones you can go out and literally eat while you're standing there. And since I grow everything organically, um, you don't have to worry about uh, being sure to wash it. And, and my little great granddaughter last spring, this is from last spring, and I had a wonderful harvest from this. Again, that is grown in a large container. That container is at least 16 inches, maybe 18 inches, and, and a deep one too. And yes, I use a very good potting soil in there. And I put a stake in because these do have to be staked. You can see how tall it is, but I got a tremendous harvest. You'll get an even better harvest if you get them in this fall. Uh, whether by seeds, you can do this right away by seeds, not any problem. You can actually, again, stagger that one, okay? So uh, continuing on with this, and these are pictures from last spring, okay? I had a very good crop of collards also. I love the green leafy vegetables. They're very good for you because I grew up on them, so I'm accustomed to them. Collards turnips. I love the turnip tops. I love the turnip bottoms cooked. Um, they're wonderful. And I had, again, fantastic luck with those. I also, behind that, had some mustard greens that were pretty much going to flower already because it was getting late in the spring. And I also harvested some wonderful cabbage. You can see the smaller ones where there's a little bit of golden color there, or lettuce. And there's two sizes of lettuce, again, from seed. The beautiful thing with lettuce is that you can start seeds in part shade right now and succeed with it and have that as a harvest and then do it successfully. You could probably get four at least uh, sowings and plant some of the plants too. And you're going to have a continuous harvest until frost takes it out. So thinking in terms of planting a little bit at the time, planting a few seeds, planting a few transplants, you're going to have two delivery times on that. And so you can, even in a small space, you can have a lot of fresh food. Um, the next one I was really excited about, I have never grown such incredible, um, spinach. This again was in one of those large containers. And what I did, I did a little pre-planning with this. I planted the spinach seeds and then in some I planted the spinach transplants on the outside of that container. I put into the center at that time when I planted it a nice strong support because I knew 
that as soon as the weather opened up, I was going to plant a tomato in there. So what I did was utilize this container to enjoy spinach, and I did it with lettuce also. Enjoy the spinach, enjoy the lettuce. When it was finished, I already had a tomato growing. Now, a little explanation as far as uh, soil temperatures are concerned. We had some late frosts in April. A lot of us love to get our tomatoes in, into the ground in April, but the ground was too cold to have really great success in the ground because in ground planting is, the soil is colder than that in a container. I planted several tomatoes in these large containers in early April, knowing that I would have to cover them. But I planted them in the center of this container. And then when the frost was predicted, because this container, the soil is warmer, when the frost was predicted, I wrapped it with frost cloth and put some straw inside. And wow, did they ever grow. I was very, very pleased. So be aware that if you want to get ahead of this season, you've got to give it a little assist. And we will speak more to uh, extending the season well beyond frost in the fall. You can do that again with the frost cloth. Um, I want to, I'm going to bring it back, Danny, to talk just a, a little bit about um, soil. As I told you, my garden is an old garden and, and I've worked on the soil for years. In the very early years, yes, we rototilled. I don't rototill anymore. I turn it only as necessary with a shovel uh, to plant what I need to plant. But I'm constantly adding organic matter, but I don't always turn that organic matter into the soil. And I absolutely have some favorites. There's a lot out there and these aren't the only ones, but I will be before too long taking out the, the peas that are there. Um, I have some black eyed peas. I have some green beans. I have some cucumbers and squash and tomatoes. And as they finish, I will be continuously planting some of these fall things. And I love to add leaf growth. I compost my own leaves, but sometimes I have to supplement that. And a lot of you don't have room to compost things, but this is an excellent, excellent product. And actually I place it now on top of the soil and then work through where I'm making a row to, to plant the seeds or digging a hole to plant the plants. The worms will take this, it's gonna act actually as a mulch and the worms will be taking this down into the soil to improve it. So this is actually composted leaves that you can buy in a bag and it's great stuff. Um, talking about um, actually if you're growing, this is, uh, Another one that's wonderful. I'm particularly fond of this Coast of Maine product. It has a lot of fish meal, bone meal, worm castings, mycorrhizae, which is, is great for the, the soil. These are all good things that are in here. And I would treat this working it into the soil as I plant those plants only where I'm seeding and, and side dressing with it, again, it will be taken into the soil by the earthworms. So that's, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, if I am planting in containers, and a lot of people, let's say you have some large containers, a lot of people want to know what do they put into the bottom so that they don't have to use as much potting soil. I prefer not to do that. Yes, I know they're heavy to move around, but I have a little truck that helps me to move some of those things. I like to use the potting soil all the way down. Definitely these vegetables go a lot deeper root-wise than you think. And I really prefer to do that. 
I have some favorites as far as potting soil is concerned. All potting soil is not created equal, and but we carry some a, a line of excellent potting soils. Espoma is another good one that I did not bring the bag up for. Fox Farm again does a wonderful potting soil, and it contains worm castings and and other good natural ingredients and is organic. Okay, we have potting soils that are all organic, and then we have those that are not. I also like, and I don't know that I can pick this up easily, our own Maryfield potting soil, which is also a good potting soil. It doesn't have all the ingredients that the Fox Farm does, but it drains well and works really, really well. <coughs> Excuse me. Fertilizers. There are a lot of organic fertilizers on the market now. The one that I reach for first, that I incorporate into the soil when I'm planting, and also into the containers when I'm planting, I mix it before I do the seeds or do the plants, is Espoma products. I love the Espoma products. And this Garden Tone is a go-to deal. Just follow the instructions on the back as far as quantities are concerned. It won't last forever, but it lasts a lot longer than you might think. So with the good potting soils or the good additives that you're going to put into your soil to improve it, you're now going to add a fertilizer that's gonna be long lasting also to really get those plants going. So I really enjoy the organic Espoma Garden Tone. If I don't have Garden Tone, I'll often use Plantone. They're very similar, okay? So that works well. There's a number of other organic products down there. There is a liquid one that you can supplement with. Um, I would suggest that once these things are nicely established, maybe three or four weeks into their growing season, that you again follow the directions for this and it's all organic and we'll give it that little boost. If you're growing in containers, you're, you're watering a great deal, particularly early in the season. And so you're washing nutrients out. And so you need to replace those. And, and this is a good one to use. There are also um, slow release things that can be used. I haven't really used that much of this kind. I've usually used the other kind, but this is easy to use with, with one application and, and that should do fine. There are also um, inorganic products. Again, another one that's slow release, little tiny capsules. And then there's uh, a liquid fertilizer. Just follow the directions. This one is Jack's. And then there is Miracle Grow. So those are just a few of the things, but but good potting soil or uh, good soil to add to your existing uh, ground soil. And uh, this fertilization is, is a lot of what it takes to succeed with these things. Now, let me show you something else that I do to try to make this easy. Let's do the next one, Danny. Um, I have a lot of territory to cover. And so, well, let, let's talk a little bit about this first. This is sort of how I go about this. Um, this was plantings from last season. And, and I did plant those plants in, as you can see the darker soil there is the amendments that's there. Okay, Dan. Um, now this is how I keep down some some labor on my part because I have a lot of a lot of territory to cover. I I can't be immaculate with all of this stuff by any stretch. I use newspaper to cover the bare ground and newspaper to put between rows when I have rows, which I do have short rows of vegetables. Several layers, four or five layers of newspaper on the bare ground. And then I top it with the Virginia Fines mulch. I'm really fond of this, unless it's a slope, 
and this will wash if it's a slope. And that's when I go to the threaded hardwood, but I, I, I don't have slopes. I primarily use the Virginia Fines pine mulch, and I really do like that. Um, then I'm a little nostalgic coming uh, originally from the deep south. We had a lot of pine needles. I like the look of it. And I add that sometimes to over the, a small amount of the Virginia Fines mulch because I like the look of it. And, um, and it works too as an additional part of that mulch. But if you put those newspapers down, and I use this in a lot of other places too. The, thing, the place that you cannot use this is where you have bulbs planted. Um, and of course you don't know where they are right now because that season's over. You don't want to put the newspaper down because it will last well into spring and it could deter those bulbs from coming up. So that's one place you don't want to use this. But this is my go-to method to keep down weeding, which I don't have, I don't mind weeding to some degree, I just don't have enough time to do all that I need to do, okay? Now, um, they're not here yet, but they will be coming in soon. This is another thing that I absolutely enjoy putting in into the garden. I can do it in the spring and do it in the fall also. And that is the onions. Actually, we have, and we've got a wonderful, wonderful selection of all of these vegetables, but, but the bulbs have not arrived yet. They will come within the next couple of weeks and, and can be gotten into the soil. I love to primarily use them uh, when they're young. And I also love to cook with the tops. We have at the moment, the little bunching onions, which are fun. They're, they're a little wicked to clean, okay, but they're worth it, and, and, and they're great to just munch on, but I will use some of the foliage sometimes to add to my foods, to my soups, or whatever, so here again, you can stagger these things, and you can extend your season by doing that. You can plant some of these, which you can harvest periodically, and when the wool sets come in, you can do that. Now, you, we will also be getting sets of garlic, which you will break apart and, and plant for, again, according to the directions, depth is usually four to five inches deep in the ground, okay? And it'll grow, it'll send up its green and grow over winter. And then when it dies back in late spring is when you harvest. In the meantime, I use some of those green sprouts like this from the garlic also in my seasoning. So by planting some of these things, um, you, you've got something fresh and something organic to use that you grew yourself, which is rewarding for me, you know. But here again, these are the wonderful transplants. This particular one is cauliflower, and I love cauliflower. You, you look at these seed packets, it tells you days to maturity. For instance, if you plant cabbage from seed, it says 65 days to maturity. So you've got time to do that. You can also plant transplants. Now you've got a product coming in at two different times, which is extensive. Another thing that I really grew successfully last year and I won't tell you I had all that much success previous to that because I don't have a whole lot of space, a whole lot of sunshine to grow these things, but that was beets. And these beet transplants are fantastic. I grew the best beets that I have ever grown and they like to grow quickly. And I actually grew them in that big container with the potting soil. They were nice size, they were tasty, they were not hard. The beauty is also you can pick a little bit of the foliage while it's growing and include it in your salads, which is good. Now, speaking of salads, <coughs> we have lettuce. And I mentioned earlier that this lettuce will grow beautifully, even though it's hot right now. You can go ahead and seed some in or plant this. 
Prevent, it would love to have morning sun for protect, protection from the afternoon sun or dappled light all day. These leaf crops will grow with less sunlight than a lot of our summer vegetables. And so they really thrive for me in areas that doesn't get full sun and lettuce doesn't appreciate the heat right now. And so if you plant it out away from the hottest sun, you can grow it and you can use it and you can start some in soil. And another beauty for lettuce is among the seeds and among the transplants, there's so many different varieties and those varieties have different flavors. And I love the combination of all of them. And so by selecting the seeds of the ones that you like best or the transplants of the ones that you like best, you, you can have fantastic salads for a long period of time. Um, before I go any further, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about frost cloth and the value of frost. No, I've got something else to talk about before I get into that. Okay, I said I was ad-libbing this. All right, this, this is um, a little garden here at the Garden Center. Terry Hirschberger has been the primary person who has prepared and planted and taken care of this little garden. And he has had the most beautiful cucumbers. Now he's getting ready to put in some of these fall vegetables and he's doing it in short rows. This is one good thing about doing short rows of things is if you diversify your stuff, you confuse the bugs a little bit. If you have long rows of something, it's easier for them to find the plant of their choice. But when you integrate them, as I have done with herbs and uh, perennials and fruit, um, it's just fantastic what you can do with it. And so uh, Terry is getting ready to, this is a raised bed. A lot of people like to use raised beds, particularly if they have poor drainage or if their soil is really poor and they haven't improved our wonderful, but difficult sometimes, uh, Virginia clay, <laughs> okay? So this is, this is another good way to do that. Let's see what's coming up next. Okay, now I've got the frost cloth. Let's talk about this frost cloth just a little bit. It's a very thin spun layer that is reusable. One of my sons gave me a big roll of this one year for Christmas and everybody got a chuckle out of that. But he actually gave me something that I've thoroughly enjoyed because you can cover your things and extend the season. Most of us don't have poly houses, we don't have greenhouses, but when you cover in, in late spring or you cover in late fall to protect from frost, you really can extend that season. When you are using this, the water goes through it, the light goes through it, it'll keep the bugs out. But what you do have to do is allow when you're putting it down for the growth of those plants underneath. So you need to be a little loose, a little relaxed about it to give those plants some growing room. And what it is put down with is side pins. You can see the little metal pieces there. Very easy to take it up when you need to um, and store it for reuse later on. You can even save the side pins. They may get a little rusty, but they still work, okay? So I highly recommend the use of this frost cloth. It's also very useful to cover containers. If you've got beautiful annuals going and you don't want them to go under the frost, then use that, okay? That's good, okay. Now, all right, we have HOA that protects a lot of people from somebody planting a lot of vegetables directly in their front yard. 
So this is a friend who, who has some eating issues and really needed to grow a lot of vegetables. And so she grew this in the side yard, but it is attractive. Now this is one season. I'm going to say this is probably the spring season. And she does have a lot of the green leafy vegetables there. And they're attractive actually. So that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, certainly in your backyard spine or, or in, uh, if you have an HOA, they may not let you put it in your front yard, okay? And it needs to be attractive. You don't want to put something that's ugly in your front yard, but you do want to grow as many vegetables as possible. As you can see, they're integrated here with annuals, marigolds. Uh, I can see hosta there. There are other things now. There is another picture of that same garden in uh, the late summer where they've already put in some things for fall, but the tomatoes are still going. I think as far as being attractive is concerned, all of these fall vegetables are very attractive. A border of lettuce or a border of cabbage, a border of kale is all beautiful. What, what is not beautiful is tomatoes with cages and people who leave them there. Now that is not beautiful, okay? So when those uh, uh, tomatoes are finished, if, if they're bordering the public view, I think you should take them out. I have seen front yards that I, I didn't think were attractive because they left those things up much too long. So that would not make me happy if I were a neighbor, you know? Now, I want to talk a little bit about herbs. I think of herbs as an integral part of vegetable garden. And there are a lot of herbs growing in ground back in my vegetable garden that is fenced, as I said, with deer fencing. These, because I lost a large tree, I have a lot more sunshine right off my deck. And so I have this grouping of a number of containers there that contains all of the herbs that I love to cook with. The, the various thyme, uh, sage, there's parsley, there's rosemary. I could go on with all of those things that I feel like I've just got to have to cook with. But now I can just step out my back door and harvest those things. So it's really easy. So if you have an area where you can do this and it's easy access, it's fantastic. If you don't, uh, growing them in the ground or growing them in these containers away from there is, is a very effective way to do it. Actually, um, those herbs are pretty attractive. Most of them have some uh, the rosemary, I grow lavender back there, uh, the sage even, and the thymes all have some presence in the wintertime. And so the containers for the most part are not there. The only ones that would be there actually would be maybe where I'm growing basil. And, and another wonderful thing is that because this is the time to put these things in, we have just gotten in some marvelous shipments of um, all of the all of these veg, fall vegetables, and also of uh, the the more common and useful in cooking herbs. Love the fragrance of the rosemary; it's just wonderful, and I cook a lot with it. Now, parsley is a, a biennial, really. So you want to get some into the ground that you can enjoy, enjoy it in the spring, and then it will go to seed. So you can get some in the ground now, you can do some from seeds and some transplants and you'll have it. I use this a lot in the cooking and, and sage. I just picked up three of them, but oh, wonderful, nice, fresh plants. We also today got in violas. Now it's warm. Uh, violas and, and uh, pansies don't really like warm weather, 
and they may stretch a little bit, but you can cut them back. I, I have to have these in my spring and in my fall gardens. Number one, they're edible. You can decorate with them. Uh, particularly, I love to do that with salads or, or dress the edges of, of a lot of things, you know. Um, they complement, and I love to mix the flowers in with these things. I love particularly the violas. They are incredible performers. They will grow all winter. They may look a little tired in January, February, if we get some strong weather, but they're beautiful and, and they'll snap back and really produce a next spring. So they're all in now and, and you can, you can add these to your containers of vegetables or add them in the ground here and there. It, it's a, a great way to do that. Um, I actually picked the little figs and this is an unusual fig. Unfortunately, we don't have this particular one in stock right now and we don't have it very often. It's called a white fig, but it sometimes goes by other names. And it has a very sweet flesh. What we do have, and the reason I'm mentioning this is, I've got a couple of plants of figs within that garden that I showed you at the beginning. And they really have a lot of figs on them. I harvested some earlier and now we're having more come, but they are the brown turkey figs, okay? We do have in stock the brown turkey figs and I believe the Chicago hardy. They are pretty hardy in this area. I usually cage them and put some straw inside or some chopped leaves inside to give them a little additional protection. But oh my, I do love the figs. And, and the fig foliage is attractive too. So, you know, integrating these things, we've never thought as much about that as we do now. And as I told you, I do have some blueberries in that same area, okay? Um, before we get any deeper, and I do want to leave a little bit of time for some questions, and I'm getting short on that time, aren't I? Um, I started some things from seed uh, a couple of weeks ago. So from seeds, you can do it in the little seed starting things, or you can do it directly into the ground. Uh, I find sometimes it's easier for me to take care of them if I start them this way and then tuck them into the ground. And again, you can do the transplants. But I did put in some of my favorites and I labeled them so that I would know what they were. This is this a little, I did small amounts because I don't have a large space. I did cabbage. I did cauliflower. This one's broccoli. And oh my, these are the sugar snap peas, right? And I also started a little parsley. It's, it's easy to do them in the ground. I certainly do that all the time, but it's easy to keep track of the parsley because I like to keep some coming on. As I said, it's really a biennial. It'll grow over the winter and you can harvest it except in the very worst months. But there's so many ways to have these vegetables. Starting them from seeds in your flats now, buying the transplants uh, or seeding in the ground. So really, uh, it's, it's, it's very satisfying. It's very satisfying to grow your own seeds. You can, you can look on the backs of the packages and it will almost always tell you the, the length of time from planting to harvest. So let that be your guide. I love to, uh, for those who like cilantro, now's the time to plant that because it likes to grow on in the cooler season. The dill likes to grow on in the cooler season. And I love dill to, to flavor my salmon when I boil that. And I absolutely have to have the cucumbers. And towards the end of the season, I will use the frost cloth to extend that season. A lot of these things love that cold. They love the light frost, but they might not like a heavy frost as we get into December. And you can carry some of these things into December, well into December, just by covering them. So um, consider all of that. 
there's just a couple more slides that I want to show as much for uh, nostalgia as anything else. Yes, this is nostalgic. That, that is my brother, uh, who unfortunately is no longer with us, with his granddaughter and great-grandson. I grew up on a large farm, and we had large gardens. This is just one portion of his large garden. We grew enough food to take us through the winter. So believe me, I have been there and done that. <laughs> and I love it. Yes, it's work, but I love it. And then we were going to close out a couple of these. Remember small spaces. This is an herb garden on a deck. And the last one, the last picture is something we really enjoyed. Some of my family, daughter and her family and myself, fortunately had some special invitations for um, an outing to the White House and only for the outside. And it was in, in, by invitation only thing. It was in the late fall. And this was the White House vegetable garden. That it was beautiful. Of course, I, who would expect it to be anything but beautiful, for goodness sakes. No weeds. Uh, you can see Swiss chard in the front. There were lots of cabbage, broccoli, and onions, and beets. It was absolutely beautiful. And such a delight, really, to see it there on the grounds of the White House. Okay, Miss Sally, we have questions. We sure do. Um, a quick reminder to everybody, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So if we're not able to get to um, your specific question, please feel free to hit reply to that confirmation email that goes to me um, and I can follow up with you after class and there will be a recording of the class going out tomorrow. So we will be getting that stuff to you. Um, all right, Peg, uh, first question, when you are planting seeds, um, do you need to go ahead and fertilize then? Or is that something that needs to wait until the seeds have actually sprouted? I prefer to go ahead and get my fertilizer in the ground. If I'm doing a row of seeds, which you saw the little rows pulled there, I will put that fertilizer in the row that I've pulled and then drag my little hoe to incorporate it a little bit into the soil. I try not to work the soil any more than I have to because I don't want to keep bringing up all those weed seeds. <clears throat> but let's say that I'm putting this garden tone or plant tone down. I will pull my row, put down the fertilizer, and then hoe it in a bit and then seed and cover it. Yes. Thanks. Um, next question is, will hyacinth beans work for the fall or do you have any other beans that you recommend growing at that point? Um, I don't grow the beans later because they're more frost susceptible. You, I don't have the, the time on the hyacinth bean, but that is my bean of choice by any stretch. I don't think that there's time for pole vining beans to grow. I believe you can still get a good crop by planting the, the little green beans, the bush beans, but uh, that would be the only one I think that I would attempt to do. All right, thanks Peg. Um, do you know of any plant-based amendments without Oh, I'm wondering if this person maybe is vegan. Are there any plant-based amendments without chicken manure and bone meal? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, that leaf grow is a wonderful amendment and it doesn't have those things. It's strictly composted leaves. Okay. Yeah. And if you need any specific products, I can't see your name because it says anonymous. I mean, you may be dialed in by, by phone or um, just not ha have your privacy settings more um strict, but feel free to send me an email if you need some product recommendations or call the store and they can help you figure something out. Right. Well, certainly the leaf grow is fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question is about cabbage worms. Do they eat at night? This person sees the damage, but never actually the bugs. Well, normally you would see the bugs. Okay. Because they're definitely there. And, and I don't stay up to see if they grow eat at night. <laughs> 
Do you, no. do you think if you see them in the is, lens, is, they should maybe I contest? I they eat all the time, you know, <laughs> but, but you would see them. But if you are getting uh, bites or whatever and, and it's not perfect, it does not hurt to go ahead and, and use either of these products. As I said, I lean to the BT. The other one is a little larger spectrum and uh, because they are organic, okay. All right, thanks, Peg. Um, this is about tomatoes. Um, how can you tell as the season is transitioning, how can you tell that the tomatoes are done and it's time to remove them? Well, when they stop producing and you stop getting fruit from them or the vines don't look happy, um, if they're still green and they still have small tomatoes, they may need a dose of fertilizer to give them a boost to keep going. Um, usually, when my vines turn brown and there's no longer fruit there, then I know that plant's finished. I so gonna, I, I know it really out, turn brown and, and die, but that's me. So that I may just have some kind of issue with my tomatoes. So good to know that actually meets the third. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, next, let's see. Is the perp okay? Uh, when you were showing your herbs, there was one that was purple and had flowers, or it had purple flowers. What was that one called? showing the herbs here yeah, maybe the picture uh, a purple i showed you violas that may be what this person is talking about it's the only purple thing i've got up here right okay okay um other than the beets which kind of has a little purple i suspect because i showed this with the herbs i think um i suspect it was the violas which is not an herb but it, it is an edible uh, flower and I love to grow it uh, in my vegetable garden, particularly um, around in the containers and and I love it in my strawberry pots. Okay, I suspect that's what they're asking. All right, thanks. Uh, next question is about deer deterrents. Um, if you're planting garlic, is that actually a good deterrent for deer and other critters? Are there plants that actually act as deterrents? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, I keep hearing this and have for all my years that if you plant lavender and you plant herbs among um, your things that you don't want them to eat, that it will be a deterrent. Um, I'm almost convinced it's an attractive. <laughs> no, not really, okay. I'm spoofing on that. Uh, I have some really smart deer at my house. And, and they know exactly where the things are that are not sprayed, okay? If I spray an entire bed with Bobbix of Hasta and I miss one clump, they will find that. And it doesn't matter how much uh, lavender or how much rosemary is around it. They, they don't really care. They will not eat those things. They will not eat garlic. They will not eat the onions. They don't eat the herbs, but they don't mind. Mine don't mind walking over them to get to something they do want to eat. So I know I hear it all the time and maybe it works for somebody, but it does not work for me. So situational probably depending on. Perhaps, I don't know. Um, I have to protect them. For instance, I see a lot of our landscapers that literally uh, make a little fence on top of violas or uh, those vulnerable things that they plant in mass. So that at a distance, you don't see that black vine. Now you've got to lift those things up so that those things can grow. And if they grow through it, then the deer are going to eat it anyway. But, but there are things that you can do. I have an area that has like a little three, Foot maybe fence around it that I have been using for compost, but it's getting more sunshine now and it has the remains of some really good compost in there. It's a narrow but long, I would say it's going to be six feet wide and probably 20 feet long that's surrounded by this three to four foot fence. And I, because these leafy vegetables will tolerate a lot of shade, 
I'm going to seed those leafy vegetables into that uh, wonderful composted area. And then I'm going to cover the top with um, deer netting. It's going to only be four feet high, so those deer could get in there. But this is an area that's small, but I want to use it because I'm getting some sunshine there. So these are some of the things you can do in a small area. This is a three to four foot fence. It's not obnoxious. You cover it on the top. And guess what? When I get to the end of the season and I've got turnips and I've got beets and I've got broccoli and I've got cabbage, um, I can also easily cover that entire thing with that frost cloth. So here I've got this wonderful thing that was a compost bin for me that's now going to be where I'm going to grow some vegetables, these leafy things. So I'm going to have fun with that. And that's one way that I can avoid the deer. So there's different ways that you can do that. You can even protect small areas within a smaller property if they pass through by putting up some rebar or some nice bamboo poles to hold up some deer fencing around that small area. It's not as obnoxious as you might think visually because you really don't at a distance see it that well, you know? And if it's put up with something as attractive as bamboo stakes, then it's gonna be more acceptable to you. So there are usually ways around at least protecting small spaces from the deer. You know, I can't do that with my large space. I have to use the Bobex and spray periodically with that. But that's things like daylilies and pasta and all those things that are there, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, <laughs> <coughs> really. All right, let's see. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, does BT kill white flies on kale? Well, BT works only on the caterpillars. Okay. For that, you would go, Spino said, while it's still organic, don't ask me why, I'm not a scientist here. Um, it does kill other things. So if you're trying to kill a few other things, then you want to try the spinosad. Okay. S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, spinosad. Because the BT is caterpillar, period. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Oh, for your fig and apple trees, are those, or do you have those planted in the ground or are they in planters? No, they're in the ground. Uh, that fig, I don't think that fig would be hardy in a planter uh, unless you really covered and protected it in the winter time because it's marginal here. Okay. You need to give it a little protection, but boy, they've been fantastic for me. This year's perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Um, is it possible to plant brassica now and harvest this year? Is it better to plant for a spring harvest? To plant what? It's B-R-A-S-S-I-C-A. -S -S Brassica. Yeah. Brassica are the, all of the, the green, the cabbage that we've been talking about. The cabbage, the broccoli, they're all in the brassica family, okay? Those are the things that you definitely want to plant now. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about, okay? A okay. lot of those now, obviously, beets are not brassica, okay? and beans and peas are not, but all these green leafy things like broccoli, cabbage, collards, those are brassica, okay? All right, thanks, Peg. Okay, it's uh, 1259, so do you have anything you'd like to cover before we close out? Just if you've never done it, I encourage you to give it a try, even in small spaces. It's very satisfying, even in these containers. And, and I have a granddaughter, well, more than one, but one in particular, that's really, really enjoying uh, a little bit larger space that she has now because she has a townhouse with, where she has in ground some things, but a lot of things in containers and she's had great success. So uh, give it a try, but don't try little containers. They don't work well. 
buy bigger containers, make an investment because they'll last for a long time. And, and don't be afraid to use the plastics. Uh, you know, they're, they're fine if you leave them out over winter, especially if they're elevated off the, uh, the ground um, and fairly easy to move around. So consider it to be an investment that you're gonna be using over and over and over. I, I do that. And with my soil that's in those containers, I don't always replace all of that soil. I may replace a third of it next year when I start these things. I try definitely not to grow tomatoes in the same container year after year, however. So give it a try. I love it. And it's so helpful. All right, thank you so much, Peg. Uh, before we wrap up, just a quick reminder, there will be a reporting going out tomorrow with a coupon and a survey. Um, if any of you all have questions to follow up after class, look for your confirmation email, the one you used to dial in today. Hit reply to that, send it to me. Um, I can either forward the question to Peg, who I believe might be out of the office next week. So it can also go to the plant clinic, but we will get back to you with any assistance that you need. And uh, everybody, uh, as someone sent in the chat, enjoy your fall planting. And Peg, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you all for being with us today. All right, have a good day, everybody. Bye.